All right. Okay. Well, thank you for coming along to this um, ADI seminar, and my pleasure to welcome welcome Arun Saldana, Saldana from the University of, of Minnesota, and um, he's a fellow geographer. But he's also somebody who's come to geography from a, a different place, from communications, and he's somebody who's done a, a great deal of work around um, not just communication, obviously, but around theories of, of race and materialism, and he, that's what he's talking about today. But he's also done, as a cultural geographer and historical geographer, he's also done work on, on psychoanalysis, so all you Deleuzeans out there are about to have a, have a treat, but also done work on, on race and food, and Dutch colonialism in Goa. So there's a whole lot of issues obviously interweaving here around psychoanalysis, around race, around materialism, around affect and effect, I imagine. Mm. So today we're hearing about the human phenotype, globalisation and material theories of race. So thank you, Aaron, and um, over to you. Thanks, Louise. And so uh, I do tend to walk around quite a lot. So. Um, I'll try not to, uh, in the interest of the uh, of the virtual uh, uh, audience. So, um, um, actually, just with the virtual audience, the camera's focused on the uh, audience, so we can't yeah. see. So, if you want to walk around, you can do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we're about to change that. <laughs> okay, that's better. How about now? Excellent. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Okay. And can you see the slides, Chris? Yeah, yeah, we can see the slides. Oh, good. Now we're on. Okay, fantastic. So um, this is not a paper by any stretch of the imagination. It is uh, going to be a, a loose-ended bunch of entryways into my new book project. Um, I've been thinking about race for a long time. My first book came out in 2007, uh, which was an ethnography of um, tourism. And uh, it allowed me to think uh, through uh, race as a material process from a particular site, the Goa Trans scene uh, in India. Uh, very popular amongst Australians as well, Goa Trans. Um, after that, as Louise was saying, um, I went into history for a bit, uh, looking at Dutch colonialism more or less in order to uh, allay the fears that I was just interested in being, you know, stoned on a beach uh, in <laughs> India, uh, but, but also to, uh, to figure out how to think about race as in the long, longer term, and race as something that is not just particular to a particular society like the US or Australia, uh, not just to particular um, sites that get uh, racialized, like a dance floor or a pub, or a school uh, where various bodies get uh, segregated in, uh, uh, along with the objects that they use, but uh, race as something that is intrinsic to the way that globalization works, and intrinsic even to the way that, um, that globalization affects uh, uh, ecologies and, um, and the system of, of, uh, of capitalism itself. And so, <clears throat> a very long story short, um, I have been working on a number of theoretical projects. Uh, Louise mentioned psychoanalysis, uh, but I was also um, thinking uh, uh, of, about space itself. So a book that came out just now is uh, called Space After Deleuze. And all of this I see now as culminating in this big magnus opus type of uh, entity uh, on race, uh, a kind of uh, a theory of race uh, which should be helpful for people working in, uh, in any context, uh, so basically social theory in the, in the traditional sense. Um, but doing that in a way which, uh, which uh, pulls uh, various strands of theorizing together to, to come up with a robust uh, theory. Um, and so it is uh, going to be a theory book. Uh, on the other hand, I will also have plenty of examples um, to, uh, to elucidate uh, the theorizing. And so because um, this is an institute that talks about globalization, it will be very much about what globalization actually as a planetary scale does to thinking about race. Um, but uh, but again, there's a few strands into uh, there's a few ways of, of getting into uh, into the, the problematic, and and so uh, I'm going to be talking about a few today, uh, just in the interest of um, generating some debate. So <clears throat> I'll first talk about 
uh, just as background of my argument, uh, which is specific to cultural geography, but that you could find it across the humanities and the social sciences. Um, uh, and uh, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to argue is that we have to talk about race as a material process. And I started doing that in my PhD, and I still continue with that, um, also to the historical research. Um, but in order to do that, of course, I have to be very clear about what we mean with materiality, what we mean with materialism, uh, and how that might differ from uh, more uh, accepted or mainstream or you know, uh, circulating ways of, of thinking about, uh, about race. And then I'll make an argument for extending materiality to talking about capitalism. And that is where um, I actually come in conflict with the people of my camp, the, the, the new materialists, because uh, new materialism on the whole has been a little bit um, wary of Marxism and of thinking about uh, capital and, and the kinds of things that Marxists talk about. Um, and so that is where maybe I'm the most um, polemical uh, in this talk and also in the, in the book. Um, uh, because obviously, whenever we talk about capitalism, polemics is not very far away. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, I think, the, thing, the, the argument that has been most exciting to me, uh, because I am absolutely not from a Marxist background. And so neither my advisors nor my undergrad days, uh, there was no Marxist. And usually, if you are a Marxist, it's a very strong patriarchal, patriarchal tradition from which you come. And you know, one Marxist bequeaths another. Um, <clears throat> And it's a sort of uh, old boys network which, which presides over what, uh, what Marx said. That is not where I'm coming from, as I'll explain. Uh, this is something that I discovered in my, in my theoretical readings. And that's why perhaps it's, I'm, I'm most excited about it. And then I'll end with talking a few, uh, saying a few words about Anthropocene. I'm here, here uh, mainly because there's an Anthropocene uh, conference happening uh, 10 days or so. Um, and um, my, uh, my theoretical explorations have convinced me that talking about Anthropocene uh, is a hugely important or essential opportunity for critical race theorists to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, finesse what they think race is. So um, <clears throat> why this talk about materialism, why this talk about materiality, about matter, um, back in uh, the early 1990s, as many of you will know, Judith Butler, the queer theorist and feminist theorist, uh, said body, uh, had a book, Bodies That Matter. Uh, nevertheless, what, <clears throat> what I've been engaged with, with a, 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 a whole bunch of, a whole population of humanities and social science uh, scholars has been um, figuring out uh, how society works, figuring out how social difference uh, gets to matter, uh, and how uh, politics, um, you know, trying to make the world a better place, uh, needs to uh, uh, think about the field in which politics takes place. So as everyone is aware, um, there was a huge turn to thinking about discourses, texts, um, languages, uh, signifiers in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s, first in France with structuralism and post-structuralism, then in cultural studies. So, so my background is very much from media studies and culture studies where we all read Stuart Hall, who you know, uh, looked at semiotics, uh, all sorts of French theorists, to think about um, class, race, gender, etc. Um, and so what society was about in this framework uh, is um, structures of uh, signifiers which, uh, which, which make oppositions between, say, black and white, man and woman, uh, town and country, etc. And so the way that these differences were taught was very much borrowed from a linguistic model, uh, Ferdinand and the social uh, most uh, specifically. And so <clears throat> um, geography was part of that movement, and so cultural geographers uh, massively went to semiotics, to art history, 
to um, looking at the discourses about landscapes instead of the landscapes themselves. And so this was very much about um, understanding the constructedness of uh, social reality. And so again, the social construction of X was basically the phrase that most of the hum uh, humanities and social science um, <clears throat> scholars started uh, adopting. What happened then, and this is very much where I sort of came of age as a, as a sort of uh, interest as a theory and as someone who's interested in thinking about these things. Uh, what happened then was a kind of a return to materiality. People started saying, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. This English landscape that is depicted in, uh, in historical uh, painting, uh, can we not talk about those landscapes themselves? Uh, wait a minute, if you're talking about uh, gender and sexuality and that, that, that it's socially constructed, does that mean that gender and sexuality are only constructed? And do we mean, what do we mean with construction in the first place? And so it seemed that, initially it seemed that this was a very naive thing to ask. Of course, gender and sexuality are constructed. Of course, uh, medicine and all sorts of powerful discourses uh, affect the way that we think about bodies. But what these new materialists were saying, or as they would gradually be called, new materialists were saying, was that um, it is uh, uh, the, the language is only one part of a whole gamut of kind of kind of processes. Uh, there are biophysical processes, there are economic processes, there are technological processes, which all get, you know, as it said, mediated by language. But ma language only has an effect by virtue of other kinds of actors or other kinds of entities that need to be mobilized in order for the, uh, the words to actually have an effect. Um, and so um, when it comes to race, uh, 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 very briefly, um, uh, yeah, I'll come back to that, sorry. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the, for, for both the turn to language and, and culture, and the return to materiality, what you could see happening at the same time was a retreat from the, um, the quite dominant, uh, at least on, uh, in left-wing academic circles, a quite dominant position of Marx and the Marxist tradition. And so uh, this is again something that happened before my time. Uh, my advisor, uh, Dori Massey, she, she's a, for me the best example of where you can, what happened with critical geography was a kind of a retreat from explaining just about everything with Marx and the Marxist tradition and an opening up to feminism, um, anti-racism, uh, humanities, uh, and, and, and the arts. And so um, the, this was not anti-Marxism per se, but it was just felt that there were so many problems with the Marxist tradition, uh, you know, it's positivism, it's um, misogyny in Marxist circles itself, um, the continuing separation of man versus nature, uh, the belief in history with a big H, all of these things that can be demonstrably <coughs> linked to the collapse of the you know, Soviet Union and the communist projects. All of these were, to most people, were clearly evidence of uh, sort of the failure of Marxism to, to explain society, to actually help us change it. So, so what, what, what took its place was, was post-structuralism, so especially Foucault and Derrida. And if you see where Stuart Hall himself um, evolved to, uh, you know, by the time he writes the book Representations, which is an open university course book, a great book, uh, you know, it's all about representations, it's all about discourses, and not that he neglects class altogether, um, but there's definitely much less of a reliance on, on uh, Gramsci, Althusser, um, and Marx himself uh, from his earlier years. And, um, and so <clears throat> when we talk about materiality, when we talk about matter, uh, there's a few things that we can mean. Uh, one is the fact that just sort of stuff itself, you know, the, the old uh, argument of philosophers, you know, saying that this table is real because I can knock it, you know, all of those age-old discussions have resurfaced in this debate. Um, but to put it, you know, to not go too far into that philosophical discussion of, of you know, what is knowledge, what is consciousness, the mind-body problem, what we mean is basically, you know, talking about uh, human bodies uh, as themselves forceful and themselves affecting 
uh, how we should speak about the world instead of only mediated by, by discourses. Another site of materiality that gradually started coming up uh, was not was going beyond the, the human realm altogether. And so um, more, uh, all sociologists will know at the network theory and Latour, and you know there's a number of uh, science studies uh, scholars here as well. And so from that uh, site, what you had was uh, people saying, well, you know, materiality is not just about human materiality, about the physicality of experience and of uh, disease and of sexuality and of aging, but also the physicality of chairs and uh, sunlight and trams and, um, you know, all the way to uh, nucleotides and, you know, the nitrogen, nitrogen cycle. <clears throat> What all of this meant for me was, as a critical race scholar, you know, I, start, I said, well, how come no one is looking at race in, in this whole debate? So we're talking about gender and sexuality, we're talking about uh, science. Uh, so very often I found people come close to talking about race as a material process, but were um, somehow, you know, a little bit wary of making that step of saying that race is also a material process. And the reasons for that are totally obvious because what racist science had done, and you know, with the culmination in, in the Second World War and, 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 and Hitler's eugenics, is saying that racial difference is completely material, it's completely physical. The hierarchy between kinds of human beings is part of a natural order. And so if you're going to say as a critical theorist that, um, that race is material, race is physical, um, automatically the question arises, well, does that mean that, that these differences are just entrenched, that they're essential, and that we can't do anything about them just like we can't do anything about the difference between you know, zebras and, and lions. And so <clears throat> that is a very uh, important uh, political and epistemological uh, question that is raised there. And so part of the project here is to talk about bodies in such a way as to prevent that racial, racist science and that uh, essentialist way of talking about race that was part of biology for so long uh, to, to reappear. And, of course, as all of you know, uh, feminist theorists have done a great job uh, and show the, the entryway, one of the entryways, as, as you can realize by now, there's quite a few, um, to thinking about difference in that way because they've done the same thing with gender and sexuality going to the physicality of bodies does not mean uh, justifying the essential differences as, as a part of the natural order. Just a few covers and some articles here to talk about uh, or to show that the new materialism is a, is a buzzword. And of course, as with all buzzwords, you've got to be a little bit skeptical. Um, but, but that's where we're at. Um, the, uh, again, the, the main uh, the, the most important proponent of the category would be a, 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 a new wave of feminist theorists, uh, people like Elizabeth Gross, uh, especially a, a huge number of Australian feminists are, are involved with this turn to materiality uh, for various reasons. But you can see that new materialism is also, you know, has become very big in everything from theology to, um, to science studies to archaeology to even to marketing. Now, what, what is uh, also important, uh, remember in the beginning I was saying that the scale of the global is very important to me. I want to talk about globalization and planetary processes as intrinsically racialized. And here I'm, I am inspired by this, uh, this scaling up of what matter is and how to think about matter from bodies and things as, as happened in, at the network theory on the one hand and corporeal feminism to use uh, Gross's uh, term from 1994, on the other hand, to thinking about the Earth as such. And so new materialism sometimes seems to be uh, all about how I relate to my bicycle and how you know, uh, my muscles uh, react when I have to go up a hill. And so those kinds of more phenomenological analyses are very important, but what you saw happening in the last 10, 15 years is saying, well, it's not just about 
that level of things, the interpersonal or uh, you know me and my hammer kind of thing, but it's really about seeing material processes at all scales into you know into space. Um, and so that is that is definitely exciting, and this will be important for thinking about the Anthropocene, of course. It's the same philosophical principles that Elizabeth Gross develops in uh, a book on feminism, talking about uh, gendered and sexual bodies, as uh, uh, the, it's the same model uh, uh, the, for, for thinking about the planet as such, and life as such, and you know, um, the origin of species and, and, and possible extinction. So <clears throat> with that uh, foray into uh, talking about uh, biology, what I also need to do then, and again, all of this is sort of, I've, I've been thinking about these things for a long time, but I haven't written about uh, these uh, as such. What is important is, is defending this use of fit, uh, phenotype. And so um, uh, again, uh, with the realization that most often when we talk about racial differences and we bring in, we dare to bring in phenotype as a kind of um, materiality. Uh, it's, it's basically racist scientists saying that you know, African Americans uh, evolved uh, in different ways. Uh, uh, indigenous uh, Australians or indigenous uh, Americans evolved in different ways. So over tens of thousands of years, they accrued these dispositions which mean that, they, that their social role today can be explained by that evolution. And so, um, you know, uh, decades after the Holocaust, decades after, you know, uh, the United Nations uh, trying to get rid of, of the horror of, of the Nazi, uh, Nazi science, it's amazing that, especially in the United States, you still have scientists who claim to prove these sorts of things. And so they turn to biology to, uh, to explain the kinds of um, racial arrangements of, of, of this day and age. And so that, that is a real danger in what I'm doing. And I have to be very clear from the beginning that they are wrong and I, use, I have to use biology or, or um, you know, um, um, uh, whether mainstream or, or more radical biology to disprove them uh, so that their science is just wrong. And <clears throat> So phenotype, I mean, Richard Dawkins himself starts getting into, um, into part of what I would like to say, you know, so phenotype for him, uh, his classic example is the beaver, uh, is not just the beaver's body, but also the dam and the, the ecological niche that the beaver alterates in order for it to, uh, to, 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 to not just remain alive, but spread its genes. Um, however, as all of you know from, you know, from, uh, from the, the, the huge debate about the, the selfish gene, so-called, uh, Dawkins is a reductionist when it comes to thinking about uh, the, the genetic process of life because there's so much more else that is going on in life, uh, which is probably more interesting, especially when it comes to animals uh, and especially uh, uh, humans. And so one book I found very helpful is this one by Ronka and uh, who say evolution exists in four dimensions. And I'm sure Emma knows this book. And so, so this is a huge revolution in the way that geneticists think. Instead of thinking about uh, genetics only at the level of genes, which, like you know, Machiavellian politicians, uh, succeed in organizing their whole surroundings in order for them to replicate themselves, it's a much more open-ended and failure rhythm process at various levels. And so not just the genetic level, but the epigenetic level, so the, the context of the cell, of tissue, and all of the rest of the body in its genes are carried. Uh, and not just the body, but behavioral aspects. So bodies, of course, behave, especially animals, uh, but even plants. And amongst, the, amongst a lot of animals, but you know, some biologists say even plants, there's also a symbolic aspect. So the fourth dimension of evolution would be um, symbolic. And by the way, I would say that um, this kind of model of thinking about evolution as happening on a number of levels, uh, mobilizing a number of uh, kinds of uh, process, uh, 
should also then include, you know, uh, capitalism as a process, and so money uh, in the way that um, human life is organized is, I would argue, one part of that symbolic dimension that uh, Yablonka and Lam uh, talk about. A very simple way of, of dealing with the effort of, a, especially of evolutionary psychologists, to claim that everything is explicable by Darwin is to say, wait a minute, if you're talking about human uh, life, then you have to have conversations with the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and this is a very important political uh, thing for me to, to say that um, you know I'm interested in whatever, like reading Darwin, etc. But when it comes to the way that the nation state works, the, the way that um, religion works, the way that um, America was colonized, the way that um, famines happened, all of those are inexplicable with Darwin. And so it's really essential to have that multidisciplinarity as, um, as a, a fundamental starting point when it comes to talking about phenotype. <clears throat> so um, my main, uh, I've not mentioned them yet, but my main theoretical um, go-to place when it comes to figuring out this very, very difficult question of the reality is Deleuze and Guattari. Um, here they are in the next slide. Um, and they're also very much the, the, uh, the inspiration for uh, corporeal feminism, for, uh, um, you know, uh, Latour uh, to a large extent, for uh, a lot of the new materialist uh, turns to thinking about, uh, about bodies and about things and, and, um, and uh, physical processes. And so I'm not going to go over all of these, um, but basically their concept of machinic assemblage or sometimes a machinic is dropped, uh, assemblage thinking as it's called. Again, this is having an impact on a lot of uh, fields uh, and, and you, uh, I'm sure uh, you, you've encountered this before. Basically, assemblage instead of discourse. And so, whereas in the 1990s, we were accustomed to thinking about everything as a discourse. Uh, so Deakin University as a discourse, uh, the, the, the textuality of, of Deakin University, the, uh, the, the representations of Deakin University in tabloids or in brochures or, you know, um, in government documents or, you know, on Australian TV. Uh, what is happening now, this is again a buzzword, but, you know, that's how excitement takes place in, in, in theory. Uh, Deakin University is a machine assemblage. So Deakin University wouldn't exist as an entity without all the students being fed in, uh, without the diplomas, without the electricity coming here, without the tram taking us back and forth, or the cars, um, without the, uh, the, the, the bricks and mortar, uh, and also without the virtual connections that, you know, that, that this seminar uh, uh, is linked to. And so the, the easy way to, for me to, to uh, explain what assemblage thinking is, is that uh, instead of thinking only about language and about words, it is really about the whole range of things and flows. Uh, and, and also what that allows you to do is see the very provisional and unstable nature of that entity. And so Deakin University could, you know, uh, suddenly stop working if, of course, the, the electricity goes off or if for some reason no more students come here. And so every entity is, you know, always uh, very unstable and um, uh, heterogeneous. <clears throat> when it comes to Deleuze and Guattari's theory of assemblage is very important to talk about capitalism, and this sometimes gets lost in what is called assemblage theory. Uh, the main proponent of assemblage theory is Manuel de Landa. He, his background is media <laughs> studies, and he, he became a historian and also a social theorist. So he's uh, really trying to change sociology, uh, very worth uh, looking at. But one strange thing he does is removes all of the Marxism from the losing Guattari. And that's where I say, no, that's, that's not right, because I do think that um, the Deleuze and Guattari are extremely clear when they're talking about assemblages that uh, capital as a force is always stitching together these entities. And so without money and without investment, all of the entities that we can talk about in modern society uh, wouldn't exist. 
This sounds like good old Marxists saying, you know, it's all about capital and capitalism. Um, it's a not so, it's a bit more complicated than that, I think, uh, because what they say is that capital um, is, yes, it is the most deterritorializing force. It is, uh, as you can see, when a crisis happens, like in 2000, 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, very few of us understand or can understand how capital works. But, um, but it always requires these other kinds of processes to be effectuated. So capital, you're not reducing everything to capital. You're just saying that this is the most dynamic and most active and most inscrutable force. And then you're going to explain uh, capitalism in, in a way that, that Marxists traditionally haven't uh, been able to do. So just a quote to remind uh, most Deleuzeans and most new materialists. Um, I think Felix Guattari and I have remained Marxist in our two different ways, perhaps, but both of us. You see, we think any political philosophy must turn on the analysis of capitalism and the ways it has developed. This is Gilles Deleuze in an interview with, with uh, Tony Negri. So, um, so yeah, so this for, for me is important, even though Deleuze himself is not a Marxist as such. You know, he's a philosopher in his own right. Uh, but the way he thinks of modern society and the way he thinks processes like colonialism or uh, sexuality or um, the nation state, you know, uh, is very much indebted to, to Marxism. And so we get to do Marxism in a new way, uh, in a non-traditional way. Um, how am I doing for time, Luisa? Uh, you've gone for 34 minutes. Okay, yes. So I'll leave this quote. It's, it's very heavy and dense, um, but, but basically it's a quote from Anti-Oedipus, the, the, the main uh, first book of Deleuze and Guattari in which they explicate their theory of capitalism linked also to a critique of psychoanalysis. Uh, the main takeaway point being that they really emphasize that capitalism is extremely, I mean, murderously and madly creative and productive. Uh, it just goes on and on producing uh, because capital itself is just like this non-human force. It's like, just like an alien life form that has taken over uh, the human species. Uh, and it really doesn't care about how it grows, but it, it will grow at any cost. Um, as we can see, you know, uh, on a daily basis, if, if once, once you see that it is uh, sort of about money just accruing itself. Okay, <clears throat> so with that in place, um, uh, just two more sections in which I can first talk about uh, this a little bit further about how um, we could think about uh, race and, and then uh, just end with the Anthropocene. So another, and, and there was a link to an article that, that I shot, sort of a more popular article that I wrote, and I, I talk less about uh, capitalism in there because, again, this is a recent development for me. Uh, and um, what, um, this is not new, thinking about racial capitalism, it's, it's a term mostly associated with Cedric Robinson, his book of 1983. Um, black Marxism, the making of the black radical tradition. In that, Robinson critiques Marxism for having always downplayed race. And so Marxists always talk about class, but they very seldom mention race and gender. And if they do, they always reduce it to class. So that is one problem with, uh, with Marx and with the Marxist tradition that um, these people have been trying to rectify. They say Marx is, is right about capitalism, but capitalism always requires the oppression of women, the oppression of indigenous people, and the oppression of, of uh, other minorities in order to function. Not only that, but if you go back to the beginnings of the system in which we live, it is clear for these historians that um, industrialization couldn't, couldn't have happened without uh, you know, conquering other lands, claiming other lands, uh, enslaving entire populations, uh, and displacing uh, whoever happens to be there by all sorts of means, you know, sheer warfare or brutal force uh, or, or just intimidation or, you know, in the case of, of many places, um, uh, disease, uh, uncontrollable epidemics. And so this is not a very difficult thing to understand. We know that the after effect of these oppressions and these displacements and these enslavements are still with us. Um, in the racial division of labor in America, for example, 
uh, in Australia, in, um, uh, in, in, in all sorts of uh, different forms in African countries. Um, but this is an important, not just historical argument, but very important theoretical argument because, of course, it allows us to talk about race as being um, part of the, 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 the system, the economic system which, which we have. And by the way, the first, uh, one of the first historians who made this argument very clearly was Eric Williams, the 1948 book. Uh, if, if you're interested, he talks mainly about sugar uh, and other Caribbean commodities, which were essential, uh, not just for the wealth of the Caribbean and the American South, but that money was then led back to Britain, which allowed it to industrialize. And so that is very important. Uh, 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 the, the triangular trade, and that is a concept that most uh, most U.S. school uh, kids do get to learn about, uh, thankfully. Uh, the fact that you had this triangle between the Caribbean, especially in the U.S. South, and um, um, the West African coast, and uh, uh, the, the, well, Great Britain, uh, but the rest of Europe as well. Um, a commodity flow which actually, by strengthening itself uh, laid the basis for, for, um, for the Industrial Revolution. The main concept from Marx, directly from Marx, that I'm interested in developing a little bit more is primitive accumulation. There's a huge literature about this, um, and uh, some of you might know it better. Uh, but basically, primitive here means primary. So the fact that you had to have a whole lot of money in order to invest in factories, in order to pay a mass of laborers to produce, you know, uh, in the case of Northern England, it's mainly wool. Uh, you need, where does that money come from? How did capitalism begin? How did you suddenly have this massive production of wool um, with all sorts of technological innovations, which kick-started the Industrial Revolution and then, you know, spread to the rest of the world? So this is a huge, huge question. And one of the elements in that story that Marx uh, pulls out from you know, mainstream economists before him is the fact that you had consolidation of land, uh, land tenure and, and fields in the British countryside. And so from the late Middle Ages until the early uh, modernity, what you had was, uh, was quite a callous um, uh, taking over of small holdings, and so the human uh, uh, of, of Britain, the small landowners, uh, which, which uh, managed to provide food for themselves and their families uh, through very small holdings. They were uh, kicked off their land in various ways, or, or the land was bought at very low prices. Uh, not only that, but also the fields which were held in common, so they weren't even uh, anyone's uh, uh, property, they were also taken over. Uh, streams were taken over, forests, and so all of this all of the uh, the space, the natural space and natural resources which were shared were suddenly privatized uh, and privatized by bigger landlords. What happened then was of course that these small, um, these, these uh, best, uh, um, uh, yeomen and, and, and small farmers were displaced, they, they were uh, mobilized, they, they became sort of itinerant and searching around for, for um, for work, and the only thing that they had, they didn't have their tools anymore, they didn't have their land. The only thing they had was their own body to, to work. And so what you get is actually a creation of a working class as an effect of the consolidation of a, a, a lot of uh, fields into bigger fields. Marx calls this famously the reserve army of labor, the fact that you have so many people looking for work uh, in order to survive, that the wages can be extremely low, and of course this is the perfect conditions for uh, factories to take off in, in Northern England, especially Lancashire and uh, you know, the area around Manchester. Um, what is also interesting in his argument is that the state here is there to protect the property of the landlords and also to uh, enforce all sorts of laws, laws against uh, homeless people, laws against begging, laws against petty theft. And so very important in the concept of, of primitive accumulation is this violence of the state, the fact that you can't have um, these peasants or these uh, um, uh, people without um, any means of production 
fighting the civil war, basically, that would be uh, that would be quite something. Um, and so the violence there is is very central to to the to the argument. Specific to England is, is, is three more things. One is that it already had a strong domestic market for commodities. So this, as historians say, well, Britain was where capitalism took off uh, because they did have a strong um, you know, market that very, very much was located in London. They had uh, good roads, you know, going back uh, in, in many uh, ways to Roman times. And so it's all of that is true. These are non-Marxist arguments which are also true. Another thing that you often hear in mainstream accounts is, well, Britain got the lead in industrialization because they were just, uh, you know, smart engineers and people who made the spinning jenny, the steam engine, etc., etc. All of that is also true, but of course the question is, well, who was paying James Watt to develop a steam engine, and so you have to have that prior capital in order for you know, uh, technological innovation to, to take place. And then what is very important to me also as a cultural geographer is how did these landlords and then the early capitalists justify the fact that they were taking over land and creating poverty uh, so that they could uh, to, you know, uh, um, step up the production process. And that is uh, an ideology, a question of ideology. Um, and at the time, what was said is that, well, you know, we need to have a strong nation. Uh, England needs to take on this leading role against France, against the, the Netherlands, against Spain and Portugal. And so it was a question of early kind of a nationalism. Uh, it was about growth. It was the physiocrats, uh, as, that, uh, as political economy was known at the time. Um, that, that was a sort of a justification. And you see that also going on to, till today. There's always got to be this justification for capitalist expansion. Um, I do want to read this quote very quickly. Um, it's very famous. The economic structure of capitalist society has grown out of the economic structure of feudal society. That no one can disagree with. The dissolution of the latter set free the elements of the former. So it's very important to see that for Marxism and Marx, it's, it's, it's important to see that you know, it's not a question of staying in feudalism. It was good that feudalism ended. Um, you know, there's a certain degree of freedom here um, in comparison to feudalism and, and slavery, but that's precisely the problem. The immediate producer, the laborer, could only dispose of his own person after he had ceased to be attached to the soil and ceased to be the slave, serf, or bondsman of another. To become a free seller of labor power who carries his commodity wherever he finds a market that is, you know, his own labor power. Yeah. He must further have escaped from the regime of the guilds, their rules for apprentices and journeymen, and the impediments of their labor regulations. Hence, a historical movement which changes the producers into wage workers appears on the one hand as an emancipation from servmen and from the fetters of the guilds, and this side alone exists for our bourgeois historians. So that is true. There is a sort of emancipation. But on the other hand, and this is what you usually don't hear, these new freedmen became sellers of themselves only after they had been robbed of all of their own means of production and of all the guarantees of existed afforded by the old feudal arrangements. And the history of this, their expropriation is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. So he's, uh, he's emphasizing the fact that you could, at the beginning of our economic system and uh, at, the big, at, at every stage of capitalism expanding into new territories, there is violence. There is violence which is condoned by the state and even uh, uh, and, and the new property will be protected by the police locally. Basically, where I'm going with all of this is, again, talking about where does race come from, why, where's, how does racial difference work, how did white people come to position themselves in the center of what we call race at on a global level. And so basically, <clears throat> uh, primitive accumulation is is a sort of a first step, uh, but first step chronologically, but logically it also continues to, uh, to drive uh, the economy um, in, 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 in these ways. And so I'm not going to go over all of this because all of you will, will know this. Um, the beginnings of capitalism in Asia, and this is where my, my, uh, my Dutch, uh, my interest in Dutch colonialism comes into play. Uh, it was, you know, very ruthless. Uh, the Dutch just blasted their way into uh, what is now Indonesia. Uh, they killed whoever was against them, and they wanted to have a monopoly specifically on spices, as you know. 
Um, but uh, but it's just amazing once you start reading a little bit more how the uh, how how little difference there was between pirates who weren't working for a crown or for a country and uh, and and uh, the army itself. And so it was very uh, very ruthless. There was always cannon to support the 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 so-called uh, you know free trade. So that's that's way of um, claiming other countries, other civilizations, and then actually saying, well, we're here to civilize you, and we have, you know, you should be actually changing your customs and your food ways and your sexualities to conform to the European standard. You know, that, to me, is the beginning of, of uh, institutionalized racism. And all of that, both ideological and cultural, um, is uh, an economic is uh, is to me an expression of how capitalism worked from the beginning. One uh, site for research in geography that that you could look at very much, which uses this term primitive accumulation very explicitly, is the, is the literature on land grabs, especially in Africa. Uh, what is interesting there is, of course. I won't go into, into it very much, but the, but that Chinese uh, the Chinese uh, uh, state is heavily involved in that as well. And so, what is going to happen with thinking about primitive accumulation as China becomes a superpower after uh, after the USA? That 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 is also something that I find uh, very fascinating to to think about. <clears throat> this is another very famous quote. I won't go over it. Um, one thing that, that one takeaway point here is this fact that you have a, a supersession of countries which are at the center of the capitalist system. And so Spain and Portugal managed to get the, the, the wealth of uh, South America and be at the center and claim the rest of the world uh, for them, you know, going around the planet and then uh, staking. Uh, forts everywhere and, and having the maps uh, support their claims. But then after that, it was the Netherlands uh, and then France and England. And of course, now, uh, and then very soon in Marxist time, it became the USA, which was at the center, you know, in purely quantitative terms. And so now uh, China at the, in the 21st century is, you know, uh, most probably going to take over. Okay, so I've not talked about the ecological aspect of all of this, but again, there's a lot of literature. Of if you're talking about primitive accumulation, if you're talking about taking over uh, the lands of uh, indigenous people, you are talking about profound ecological changes. I, you know, I don't need to remind you, you know, living in Australia of that. Um, and when we scale up, the question is, OK, what does this do to the entire planet and how to think about the, about the race in that context? And so this is a short conclusion to, uh, to putting that, that uh, new materialism uh, to, uh, to, to work. A few graphs. You've probably seen these graphs. Uh, if there's better ones, then you know, let me know. But you know, everything from McDonald's restaurants to uh, it's not a very clear thing, but ozone depletion, fertile consumption, water use, everything has been going up exponentially since uh, 1500, uh, and especially since uh, uh, 1800, and so, and then even more since 1950. So obviously, completely following what capitalism has done. We could just have one graph of the volume of capital, the volume of just sheer currency that is in circulation, and it will. Similar. So these are famous called hockey stick graphs, you know, very slight increase over many centuries, and then a boost of activity on any number of, you could have number of toilets, you could have number of um, drones, you could have, you know, tourism, any statistics that you care to look at, um, capitalism has been exploding and there's no end in sight. So what the Anthropocene is, is the fact that um, all of this activity and this concentration of activity is sedimenting into the layers of the earth to such an extent that future geologists uh, at any point in time, say 100 million years from now, will be able to infer that the planet went through uh, an irreversible stage. And so th this is 
the main book which, uh, which talks about uh, his thought experiment is in 100 million years from now, uh, what is geologically legible in the Earth's crust. <clears throat> and so the, it's quite a, I mean, for me, well, the most fascinating thing about the Anthropocene concept is that it takes for granted that humans will go extinct. And so the question is, you know, how long do we have left? Uh, and how can we, you know, not die miserably uh, as a species? Um, and so, you know, f for me, it's the most fascinating concept, um, or maybe the most important concept ever. These are unintended effects, of course, which makes it all the more difficult to assign blame. Um, but what is clear is that uh, the crises are multiplying. Uh, you know, Australia is at the forefront of these crises. Uh, extreme weather, depletion, wildfires, uh, it's increasing uh, possibility of disease, low-lying uh, cities which can go to waste, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, the, 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 you just turn on the TV and you can see that these, these potential catastrophes are multiplying. Very important to say is that all of this is, oh no, that's my next slide, but all of these catastrophes and these effects are, of course, unevenly, unevenly uh, distributed, and that's the important thing. Um, and the more philosophical conclusion, so this slide is a little bit about where we would agree with the geologists about the Anthropocene uh, you know, being demonstrably happening. Um, but this would be where humanities and social scientists have criticized the concept and said, okay, Anthropocene, the age of man, the age of humans, you know, which humans are we talking about? Um, is the Anthropos just one entity? And of course, as you know, everyone from feminists to, to um, development uh, sociologists have been saying, uh, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of difference whether you're living in Chicago or um, or San Diego or Johannesburg or uh, Beijing. It's going to be extremely different uh, according to your class position, your, your racial position, and your gender position. Some have been talking about the Trumpo scene. I think that's a very apt phrase because what what you see in the figure of Trump and a whole bunch of Republicans even before him is, is a, a very clearly racist and white supremacist denial of all of this taking place. And so how we got here, again, like because of industrialization, because of um, the, you know, the, the slave trade, the, the clearing of land, of indigenous peoples, all of the the, the fact, uh, all of the, uh, uh, the whole origin story of capitalism is one of race, but also the effects of capitalism through ecological and um, all sorts of uh, you know technological ways is going to affect people you know hugely differently. So the people who are denying that all of this is happening uh, are are just nakedly you know self interested and. Um, and will do everything to keep the system going uh, for themselves. So this is a website. If you've not seen it, uh, I think it's a great teaching tool. The <clears throat> historical emissions. So India, uh, this is uh, recent, of course, but obviously the, the, em the em emissions of carbon dioxide have been uh, mostly in Europe. Um, the consumption is, is similar. Historical, of course, uh, India and China are much smaller and, and Europe is much bigger, bigger. When you look at the people at risk, this is what happens. So, to me, that is a question of race. To me, the way that this, this situation came about, the fact that people are going to die much sooner and much easier in some places than others, uh, and, uh, and they, they are least responsible. Uh, that is a question of unconscious or uh, n n not, um, you know, this is not to say that every European or every American is a racist when it comes to climate change, but this is a structural kind of racism which is sort of embedded in, uh, in the process uh, of climate change. So the Anthropocene, I call a racial regime um, for, 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 those, uh, for those reasons. And the more that governments and companies and publics are not 
jumping on board with trying to uh, do something about, especially climate change when it comes to Anthropocene. Uh, the more I think that what we see is a continuation of a colonial mindset, um, which, which will hurt uh, uh, certain populations much more. And what I'm saying again is not new, like most of the things that, that I, I've been coming up with, I draw from certain sources. And climate justice is a term that you've all heard. I'm sure uh, climate racism is a term that you uh, hear sometimes. Uh, one campaign was interesting when Black Lives Matter of the United Kingdom, they went to Heathrow Airport and they had banners saying that, you know, don't fly because the, 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 to fly in these days is in itself already a racist act. So, you know, to most of us that sounds a bit extreme, uh, but it makes perfect sense to me if you remember that racism is not just something interpersonal, but something structural and something that is even, you know, um, entangled with ecological processes themselves. And so I think that's where I'll end. It's already been quite a while. Um, so uh, sorry that it uh, was jumping around, but the, the, pro the, the book project is going to uh, uh, try to be more consistent. So thanks. Thank you. Reminds me very strongly of uh, my geography teaching, which is really wonderful. So the great acceleration is something that uh, yes. we kind of end up with because I don't want to depress the students too much. So it's at the kind of the end, because right. yeah. <laughs> it is pretty overwhelming stuff. But I think you're also not just presenting that as obviously insightful, but it's also an analysis of it, which actually obviously helps a great deal more of understanding That's what's right. going on. Yes. And, um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, well, a lot of I mean, there's is. a lot of it is. But there's quite a lot there, but there's also there's, there's hope, I guess. Yes. And so, anybody who's got... Yeah, yeah. Michelle. Yeah, oh, thanks a lot, Aaron. I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah, so just in terms of, you know, the racialized colonial origins, I mean, origins of the Anthropocene and the Anthropos, you know. So so, so where's where's the where's the evidence for so what people call post-human hope? Or, mm. You know, yeah, I just wanted to ask you just... You know, sure, yes. Because this whole idea about indigenous traditions of thought. Mm -hmm. You know how indigenous theorizing and also, you know, uh, theorizing from a minority position and how that sort of come, come together with maybe the Deleuze, Guattari and the other mm -hmm. stuff. So do you find that's, that, that helps in a way? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I think so. Um, there is, of course, uh, with, with, with Standing Rock, uh, yes, so, so the, the whole um, that whole um, saga in that I was not very far from, from where I live in Minnesota. I had a student uh, working on it, he just finished Kai Bosworth. Right? So uh, it's very clear that indigenous struggles have immediate universal uh, uh, importance. Um, they might seem to be local and pertaining to a particular nation state or a particular uh, amount of, of rights that they're trying to claim, uh, land rights or, or representational rights or, or but um, but it's 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 true that um, but I, I guess that is one of the uh, inputs for me for what kind of politics that we're going to look at and so uh, yeah because of the question of capitalism you know that that is a global behemoth and um, the the political question of getting beyond capitalism is of course huge and old. Uh, but, but when you're talking about hope, th that is the main sort of hope that I see um, emerging in left-wing political theorizing, the hope that you can, just like we went from feudalism to capitalism, it is possible to conceive of at least a, another system which wouldn't be as destructive. And that might happen in certain pockets, that might happen at the level of you know the some kind of United Nations, but what it, will have to do is mobilize many places at once and many, you know, indigenous and anti-racist struggles at once. And then the other thing you said about post-humanism, I, I didn't mention that word, but that is very closely linked to new materialism for sure. And <clears throat> um, uh, I mean, the, the, the cyborg manifesto of, of Donna Haraway was, was a real moment in, you know, feminist theorizing. Um, and I think it's really important to think about biotechnology and the ways that human being itself, the human species itself, is becoming sort of uh, more and more entangled with 
non-human forces and, te and technology especially, and artificial intelligence. But I sometimes think there's, there's still a little bit too much of, of hope there, instead of thinking about the social arrangements which will have to change. Um, because as you know, you know, uh, capitalism is striving thanks to um, AI and self-driving cars and drones and all the rest of it. And, and the, the fact that we are in the monopoly stage of capitalism again, with Amazon and <clears throat> Google, etc., huge, huge amounts of um, profit there um, is because of this, uh, you know, um, belief that that the technology as such can help us overcome, you know, whatever problems we have. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't think technology is the answer? It is part of the answer. But I think, in, in a nutshell, the answer has to be a different way of, of organizing society. Yeah, and then technology will have, has to help with that. I mean, it's I'm fascinated by seeing how every ten years, connectivity and biotechnology and exploration of you know um, matter, the fundamental be, you know building blocks of matter, proceed. Like science is great. Um, but without some kind of uh, discussion about what the science is for and what kinds of good things it can do for everyone, I think you know you just lose the, the, the real power of science of technology. Sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, Bon. Um, yeah, um, thank you. I'm, I'm really fascinated with the assemblage um, concept. And I just had a couple of questions. I mean, a, a lot of these areas are hard to grasp and I'm coming from a philosophical art perspective. Um, one is I wondered whether you'd be able to shed some light on the Irigaray conference a couple of years ago. Elizabeth Gross said she was not a new materialist. She's, de she's declaring herself as a materialist. Mm. That was in 2016. I was wondering if you could get, shed some light around that and also um, my own interest um, uh, is within Canberra Art and Donna Haraway um, looking um, looking to indigenous culture um, and science to as a way of yeah dissecting capitalism and de and therefore to decolonize society. Um, so I guess what I'm curious about is um, um, and why I think your book is so interesting is why it's within the area of feminism to dissect um, uh, gender and race mm -hmm. um, when in fact gender is kind of located within race so like um, uh, like where you're from where I've, where I've just been as well um, Lakota, Dakota, Lakota has five uh, genders and you start to look at you know when you look outside the the Western um, European um, uh, well, gender indoctrina indoctrination, because you start seeing, okay, well, other races have more than one gender, so where does that sit within society? So it, it almost seems like gender is the 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 the, the root of how to. Um, sorry, race is the the root of how to really look at where society is. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, and I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, so, I was wondering, yeah, and, and how that all sort of fits with, and I really appreciate it, looping around back to, um, I guess, society and, and, and well, I, I'm taking this so seriously because, as a rigorous says, artists can create social change because people, mm. you know, these sort of theories can be communicated through art, and I, so I feel like I've got a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Gross has fa essential work in linking Riga right to Deleuze um, and, um, and Darwin, and so, you know, she, she's fantastic for that. And, and so, you know, the question of which comes first, sexual difference or racial difference, that's a huge, uh, uh, yeah, that, that is extremely difficult to, uh, to have a short answer to. Um, but uh, why Gross call, uh, calls herself, doesn't want to call herself a new materialist, I think 
Um, my guess is that she, you know, she wants to have some kind of independence from a non-impossible and uh, sort of see her work as being um, maybe at a different uh, level of philosophical discourse where new materialism is very much something that is of the social sciences and humanities and this interdisciplinary conversation uh, under that rubric, uh, maybe uh, Close is, is more comfortable saying, well, I'm a feminist philosopher and that's, that's what I do. And within feminist philosophy, I'm closer to materialism, i.e. thinking about bodies and um, closer to the sciences and, you know, going back to uh, Spinoza and Nietzsche uh, and then way before that, the ancient atomists. So, <clears throat> so this question of, uh, you know, materialism, I needed to mention new materialism because, of course, it's called new. Mostly, I think, there's not a clear answer to this, in distinction from Marxism, from the old materialism, because in the 20th century, what you usually say is, you know, um, in the social sciences at least, I'm a materialist, which meant I'm a historical materialist or dialectical materialist. Um, there are other materialists, you know, the people who think that the brain, uh, that the mind is reducible to the brain, and so that's a whole area of... Um, discussion in, in psychology and philosophy of mind, uh, but at least in, in geography uh, and sociology, uh, when people say new materialism, I think what they meant is that they're not Marxists, so they're doing materialism in a new way. Um, and then, yeah, what was, and then the, the, the question of, well, yeah, I mean, when, when the Lakota think about gender in a different way, more fluid or have more than two, uh, that to me wouldn't be a question of race, but culture. And so they are a particular uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, culture, which has, of course, changed from 200 years ago. And some things will have remained the same from pre-colonial days, um, others not. Uh, so it's for, for me, it is important to make a distinction between what a culture is and what race is. Um, ra race is a whole way of um, of subordinating people. And so the fact that the Lakota don't have access to, you know, representation or or also like, you know, water and et cetera, uh, that, that to me is a question of race and racism. Um, but that they have that and, and I could agree completely with you that we have to look at non-Western ways of thinking about, you know, cosmology and the origin of the world or, you know, uh, natural resources. Um, but um, but yeah, so 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 uh, it's in, uh, it's it's in that conversation, in that dialogue uh, with indigenous people from a lot of places. Uh, you know, depending on the particular problem that they're dealing with, if it's water, if it's uh, human-animal relations, uh, you know, use of uh, indigenous technologies, fire uh, to, to 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 you know to manage ecosystems. So that, that to me is important to, uh, um, yeah, to see it as a sort of, uh, yeah. but, and at the same time not exoticize the, the, uh, the indigenous knowledge either. So that, that, that could also happen. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, can I just ask through the various machines if there's anybody off campus in, in the virtual deacon that has any questions? I guess you can hear me, and I guess it's a no. Okay. Any other questions in, in the room or comments? Yeah. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. I um, would like to ask why um, the way you're using the term and and why mm -hmm. it's, how it's useful to you. Um, so it's been proposed as a uh, initially proposed as a, an epoch to follow the Holocene, the Pleistocene, mm -hmm. um, and uh, to, 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 to shape the way we think about our present moment. Um, and the implications of the Anthropocene, of course, are incredibly racialized, as yeah. you made really clear. Um, and you're but are interesting that how as it evolved, I mean, and, and, and Trumpocene seems to be at the heart of this too. There's, it's no longer an epoch as so much as a re regime, mm -hmm. and an intrinsically racialized regime. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's a, tra it's a huge transformation in my mind to see from an epoch to a regime. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at what point does it start being um, a confusing term as, a, mm. as opposed to a really enabling term? 
because it has all these layered other meanings attached to it. Mm. And is it, is it just uh, centering uh, the geocrats, the geologists, the stratigraphers who, who, yeah. can, who are the ones who can decide about what to call those scenes? Yeah, no, it's a, a very huge question. Um, and a number of colleagues of mine in human geography just have said, you know, I don't want to use the term. They just really don't like it because of this uh, implication that all humans are involved in the same way and responsible in the same way. Um, I do feel that uh, I want to use it. Uh, and I also w don't use Capitolocene, you know, because Jason Moore, as a Marxist, uh, is... Uh, He's got a very strong argument for uh, for saying why do we call it anthropocene if it was all capitalism that's changed? It was not the human species. It was only you know two three hundred years ago that something happened um, in the way that humans organize themselves that have these huge effects. Uh, that uh, you know including things like the nucle uh, nuclear um, bombs, which will be measurable. And so the reason why I say, well, I do want to use Anthropocene is a kind of, um, uh, it's just a, uh, about uh, opening the conversation with the geologists and the stratigraphers and convincing them uh, about taking seriously what, to, what they mean with the Anthropocene. So, so that, that, uh, that, that's where I would like to take this, in, in the sense that if we insist on calling it Capitolocene, or Champo scene, even, or uh, Cthulhu scene, to talk with the Donna Haraway, um, then the, 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 uh, we, uh, we risk um, shutting down the conversation with scientists. And I do believe that, uh, that that is really important because they, as you say, they have the power to, they have much more power than us. In, in a nutshell, especially when you bring in geoengineering into the picture, uh, the fact that to ameliorate all of this, you know, it is to scientists and engineers that the public looks at. So my, my feeling is that by saying uh, the Anthropocene is, is real and it's a, it's a preferred term and already in circulation, we succeed in, uh, in uh, being at the table with these more powerful entities like uh, stratigraphers. And uh, on the other hand, it's also important to realize that amongst the scientists and the geologists, there are people like Jan Salavis, Sivitz, and uh, who are, you know, who are progressive, who are even left-leaning, and who are understanding more and more that they have to look at the social sciences to understand how the Anthropocene came to be. And so, in order to push that conversation forward, you know, in one uh, article, they. The, in, in science, I believe it was, uh, they even start uh, talking about world systems theory and Wallerstein and, 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 and things like that. So for me, that, that is exciting. And that wouldn't happen if we say that Anthropocene is, is, is a myth, uh, as one Marxist put it. Um, does that start to answer the... Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, uh, yeah, no, that starts that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but it's a, but it's an important point to be skeptical. Um, I mean, I find it exciting that you know from all disciplines, isn't it crazy that we start talking about a term from geology? And so that that is very very strange. And so I find that exciting. Um, I mean, we're not going to do that with Jurassic or you know um, the Cambrian uh, as previous. Uh, oh, but you said specifically about what gets lost. So I think it's both. It, it, is an, it, it is an era, so the term is, the provenance of the term is geology. And so for me, first of all, it's a geological term. But because it's uniquely about the humans and about the human species and about the, the power relations within the species that brought this epoch, it is also a critical term or something for the humanities and social sciences. So it's also a regime, it's also a biopolitical order, it is also um, a, um, the, a way of talking about the ecological dimension of modernity. So these are terms which are, you know, which, but, but since it's about the last two, three hundred years, it, it can't just be geology that talks about it. So, yeah. That's why you know geology at some at this point needs the humanities and the social sciences. As you can determine, they not accepted. Well, hopefully it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you said that you don't 
drag into the conversation the Gibson and Graham end of capitalism as we mm. know it argument, which is basically that the focus on capitalism is a focus on a system which is basically at the top of a, an iceberg mm. and there's a whole lot of other social and economic relationships mm. that we don't necessarily think about as part of that system, mm. that domestic labour, criminality, exchange mm. systems, indigenous systems, whatever else, mm. that there's actually a huge amount of other economies and social relationships happening that are kind of, well, in some, uh, some points they say it's outside of capitalism mm. and other points it's interdependent with it, but in a way it doesn't matter. Mm. I guess the point to you, and perhaps the question to you is that you're very much centred, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy and comfortable to have Marx you know, mm. re-inscribed, rah, rah, but by in doing so, you've actually basically said, this is the system, mm -hmm. and that's it, right. and that's the problem, mm -hmm. whereas there's all this other alternative real stuff mm -hmm. which is actually going on there, and mm -hmm. they argue that you can actually reframe it. It's sort of a discursive argument, which is not quite a material one. Well, it's political, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that too, that if you actually start to look at that stuff, there's alternative economies, and, and value it and grow it, then in fact, you've got an alternative. Mm -hmm. So, what, yeah. What's your so, take on I mean, I think it's really their argument is super important, mm. and um, uh, and it's I think part of a political response to capitalism to understand it as not being, you know, omnip omnipotent mm. and uh, monolithic, mm. and it has, of course, geographical variations. I mean, the whole question of domestic labor and all sorts of um, oppression which needs to be in place for class mm. oppression to take place. I mean. Yes. The power of of adults over children, uh, heterosexism, uh, and, uh, and then uh, women's labor. Uh, I think all of those are uh, essential rectifications of Marx's story, where Marx was just completely, you know, blind to a lot of things. But I think I, I, I disagree with them. With I mean, so it might be the tip of the iceberg, but the tip is actually holding it all together. Mm. And so the way that I think of it theoretically is that sure it's true that things are leaking and you know that there are these other arrangements and there's uh, huge amounts of informal labor mm -hmm. you know which do you call that commodities or not and it's not uh, and, and all sorts of service provision and the economy is very very complex um, but uh, but but that has always been the case with capitalism and so. The way that I think about it is that you know capitalism requires that, but it's it's still it still uh, it still thrives and it still expands, and so that's one way to to see it um, as a more multi-layered uh, system, mm. and um, and it requires those kinds of <clears throat> informal economies that seem to be a little bit outside of it, mm. in order to grow again, and then. Usually what happens is that those informal economies then get more formalized or get more capitalistic as well. So when you're talking mm -hmm. about Africa, um, especially, you know, where capitalism is just jumping to sort of start and, and India, I was just, it's true that, that a lot of the economy in, in India is not capitalist at all. Um, but, but all those companies who are there are benefiting from those informal economies in some way. And so, so I'm more pessimistic than Gibson and Graham. I think that, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, the part of the political response has to be, you know, understanding that capitalism is not mm -hmm. invincible, and that it can actually, you know, um, be sort of chipped away in certain points, and then hopefully there's a momentum which actually that changes, changes it all together. Mm -hmm. okay. That's at least a sort of okay. huge belief, hope. It might probably just maybe a final question. So I was wondering where does the materialism, I suppose, seems, I feel like I've, it's, it's fallen a bit out mm. from the kind of ontologies of race that I know you, you've come from. Mm. So I want to know, do you have an ontological, you know, materialist account of, you know, the origin of, of capitalism or at least industrialism? And, you know, do you have a kind of niche construction theory of mm. European masculinity or something. Mm. Um, and I suppose that's one question. I suppose the other question is is really about kind of diagnoses and and, and 
and therapy for the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene has yeah, opened up um, and it's kind of drawn attention to humanities and social sciences like because we're all seriously in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're kind of getting desperate and looking even to social scientists for help, we being the kind of you know, dominant scientific norm. Um, and, I mean, there's a sense in that race and kind of anti-racist projects are in real trouble because if we're all going to die, then, you know, who does it matter who dies first? Mm. We're all going to die in the end. Um, so I think there's a sense that we, yeah, people could be very uninterested in race. But you're, I think you're kind of proposing that you know, we have to end racial capitalism. And so dealing with race is intrinsic to solving the anthropocentric and I don't think yet yeah, the geoengineers are going to be particularly interested in that argument. Mm. But I just suppose wanted you to talk around a bit whether in your book, say, you're actually going so far as to propose a, a remedy for the Anthropocene. Yeah. Um, well, your first question about um, niche construction and the origins of capitalism, uh, I think that's... Um, that's a great question. And uh, Andreas, uh, Andreas Malm, he wrote a book called Fossil Capital, which is uh, getting a lot of press. Uh, and he is a pretty classical Marxist. I don't agree with him on a number of things. But he does really good work in talking about the, the environments in which ca uh, industrial, the Industrial Revolution could take place. You know, the water that was there, the wool. Um, and uh, there are even better environmental historians. I mean, he's not an environmental historian, but there's, there's quite a lot of environmental history that I've been dabbling with uh, when it comes to talking about something like the beginnings of industry or, or also patriarchy, or um, you know, uh, especially when it comes to Australia, the settling of, of Australia by white people, you know, all of those ecological processes that needed to be in place uh, and you know, getting rid of the ecological arrangements which were uh, which were guarded or um, you know uh, managed by indigenous people. So so there are uh, environmental history would be the sort of field for that, uh, and then there's various level of reliance on Marxism there. Um, William Cronin is one of the best who was sort of like uh, in geography, which who is sort of uh, you know more more interested in in, 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 in Marx. But um, when it comes to the Anthropocene, I mean, a very big question which I've not, you know, solved yet is that the sort of ultimate thing of communism is that actually getting rid of the Anthropocene or not, since the Anthropocene is basically something which capitalism has retreated to humanity. Would, does a Marxist have to posit the, the hypothetical possibility of a system called communism which would not be Anthropocenic? And that's a more than a semantic question. It is really like, okay, if we have, if we're going to change the earth in such a heavy way that any kind of intelligence 100 million years from now is going to figure out, okay, you know, something changed here, uh, would a better economic system still do that? And, you know, presumably not. Um, and, you know, um, the, the actually existing communism in the 20th century was, of course, disastrous. I mean, the kind of industrialization of the USSR and China uh, um, developed was, was, was as bad for the environment and also had also some racializing um, uh, effects. But, um, but yeah, the remedy for the Anthropocene, um, um, th th that is a very big political question which I will have to delve into. I, I think that very few Marxists go there uh, talking about communism, but I'm quite interested. I call it geo-communism, uh, just to distinguish it from you know, the communism that, that failed in the last century. Uh, so yeah, geo-communism would have to have some kind of a um, um, different arrangement which wouldn't be basically killing off the human species or possibly killing off the human species, uh, since capitalism is geared, as I had in a slide, geared to sort of not do anything about, you know, the, the four and a half degree warming that, you know, scientists say that, that, uh, that, that could happen by the end of the century. Um, now, but one, but it's, it's, it's not true that we're all going to die, you know, because 
uh, people are already dying and some people are dying more than others. And just like in any calamity of a huge scale, you know, some people are going to be better off actually. And so, you know, when scientists talk about the end of, of um, hum the human species, that is a really sort of extreme point. And um, unless there's, a, I mean, there could be a nuclear war, uh, which, you know, could end it very quickly. But uh, I don't know if you know Rob, uh, Rob Nixon. He's got a, uh, he's a political ecologist and an activist. And he's got a, a concept called slow violence. And so it's mostly to slower forms of violence, like famine, and you know uh, displacement and refugees uh, and you know storms that gradually come up and so the, the the extinction is more like you know the extinction of indigenous cultures. It's more sort of um, patchy and some are more exposed to it than others. And so um, I do find it fascinating to to see that we're talking about such a heavy topic as human extinction and more and more. Um, but we have to think of it as a taper process and a very geographically, you know, um, uh, variegated process. Thank you. I'm going to call a hold there because it's it's one o'clock. So thank you, virtual listeners. Many many thanks, Aaron. That was actually a really interesting and very wide ranging and provocative, thought provoking uh, presentation. So um, join with me for thanking Aaron for. Uh,